morning, everyone. Um, yeah, as Mark said, my name's Chris. I have the pleasure of helping to lead Lifehouse Community Church across our locations in Bicester and Banbury. Uh, and I've also realized that I have dressed to match our new venue, which is, which is a complete accident, but quite, uh, quite visually satisfying. So I'm enjoying that this morning. Yeah, yeah. Uh, maybe they designed it around this outfit. Who knows? Um, but yeah, as Mark said, we've been, in a, we've been in a teaching series this autumn looking at simplicity. Uh, these, yeah, well, they're not simple things, but they are, they are habits that help us to follow Jesus. It's a, it's a back to basics kind of series, uh, stripping back some of the clutter and focusing on the essentials of following Christ. Because being disciples of Jesus doesn't need to be complicated. Um, so far, we've looked at habits of worship. We've looked at being close to God, learning and speaking faith. And this morning, uh, we get to finish the series looking at service. But before we get on to service, I'd like us to take some time just to think about success. How do you measure success? How do you measure success? To use language from the corporate world, what is your metric for success? I hadn't quite realized just how big my PowerPoint was going to look on this, uh, this big slide, but we have a big graph thinking about how we measure success this morning. Um, many of you know that when I'm not up the front preaching, I am up the front teaching uh, at a further education college in Oxford. And we've just hit the point at the end of our first half term where we sit all of our students down and go, um, what is, like, how's the first term gone for you? How, how's it going? Let's set some targets. And then the next term, we revisit those targets and we go, okay, have you hit them? Have you not? What can we do to help you succeed better as a student? And in, in most jobs, there is some sort of way of, of measuring your progress or measuring your success. When you're at school, it's, um, oh, did I get an A on the test? How, how, am I, how are my grades looking? It may be uh, in your workplace, you have, a, you have a yearly appraisal or something like that. Your boss sits you down and, and she helps you reflect on your performance or uh, the, maybe the, the amount of sales that you've made throughout the year. Maybe it's about meeting deadlines. Have you done that successfully? Maybe your metric for success is, is closely linked with someone else. My son really listened when I asked him to do something, perhaps. Or my baby daughter finally slept through the night. My football team won our game this week. I, I was flagging, but my teammates had my back. Maybe you're working towards something in particular. Maybe you're saving to buy a house or storing up annual leave so that you can go on a big holiday. Maybe you've got your eye on the new iPhone 16 or, or a particular classic car. However you measure your success, the thing about success metrics is there's always something more. You met all your targets that you said in last year's appraisal. So your boss sets you some new ones for this year. You don't get to rest on your laurels. Your daughter did really well in her GCSEs, and now the pressure's on for A-levels. Your football team got promoted, and now there's a whole new league to work your way up to the top of. Does it ever make you feel tired? I don't know about you, but sometimes success feels unattainable. There's always another hill to climb. There's always another sales target to meet. It can make me feel disheartened pretty quickly. We work and we work and we chase after success, but we never seem to quite reach it. It isn't satisfying. In fact, it, it sometimes leaves us feeling empty. Meaningless, meaningless says the teacher in Ecclesiastes. Utterly meaningless. Everything is meaningless. All things are wearisome, more than one can say. The eye never has enough of seeing, nor the ear its fill of hearing. I denied myself nothing my eyes desired. I refused my heart no pleasure. My heart took delight in all my labor, and this was the reward for all my toil. Yet when I surveyed all that my hands had done and what I had toiled to achieve, everything was meaningless. A chasing after the wind, nothing was gained under the sun. In these passages, Solomon, the writer of Ecclesiastes, has been working and working and working 
and he's been enjoying his work. But when he looks back on everything that he's achieved, he still feels empty. Over the course of the book, his search for satisfaction and success reveals that life without God feels long and fruitless and tiring. His search for pleasure, wealth, and success is ultimately disappointing. And he goes on to learn that nothing in the world can fill the emptiness and satisfy the deep longings of our restless hearts. Because we were made for more. Humanity was created to be in relationship with God, to be his children and know him as father. This should have been enough, but it wasn't. We can read the story in Genesis 3. Our desire for power and knowledge led us to disobey God. We had everything we could possibly want, and yet we ran away chasing things that could never satisfy us. That emptiness, that search for something to satisfy the yearning in your soul, that is a longing that only God can fill. Because we were made for relationship. We were made with relationship with our creator. And in our disobedience, in what the Bible calls sin, we broke that relationship. We were far away from God, chasing after something, chasing after anything that might feel like a temporary fix for our brokenness. But the good news in all of this is that God has a permanent fix for all of us. He became human. This person we call Jesus, fully human and fully God. And when Jesus died on the cross, he got rid of our sin and brokenness forever and restored the relationship between us and God. It's a permanent fix, and it's yours for the taking. Jesus didn't stay dead. He rose from the grave and is now seated with God in the highest place. He reigns forever, and he wants relationship with you. Let me tell you, relationship with Jesus Christ will satisfy that longing in your heart. That emptiness will be transformed into completeness as you unite with God who you were made for. If you'd like to find out more, if you'd like to reconnect with God for the first time or for the 50th time this morning, I would love to pray with you at the end. As followers of Jesus, then, We've been transformed. We are united with the God who brings eternal satisfaction. As it says in John's Gospel, we have drunk from the water of life and will never thirst again. So as Christians, all of those old success metrics just aren't going to cut it. We need a new success metric. We need a new way to measure. What does it look like for us to follow Jesus well? Well, let's have a look at what Jesus says. If you need a Bible, there are some on the bench up at the front here. We are in the New Testament in the second half of the Bible, in the book of Mark, chapter 10. Jesus has been traveling around, healing people, performing miracles, and gathering a group of disciples. If you want a, if if your metric for success is having a cool nickname, then hanging out with Jesus was the way to get it. Reedy Simon, he renames The Rock. In this passage in Mark, we see James and John, known by Jesus as the Sons of Thunder. So uh, Rocky and the Sons of Thunder have been traveling around with Jesus. They have seen him cast out evil spirits. They've seen him heal the sick. They have climbed a mountain with him and saw him transfigured. He's He's revealed his divine nature to them shining bright with the glory of God. They know that this man, this cool nickname giver, this healer, this provider of food for thousands of people, this man is the Messiah. He's the savior promised in the ancient scriptures that would would save God's people. We'll come back to that later. But for now, we're going to pick up in Mark 10, verse 35, with James and John, the sons of thunder, asking Jesus a question. Then James and John 
the sons of Zebedee, came to him. Teacher, they said, we want you to do for us whatever we ask. What do you want me to do for you? He asked. They replied, let one of us sit at your right and the other at your left in your glory. You don't know what you're asking, Jesus said. Can you drink the cup I drink or be baptized with the baptism I am baptized with? We can't, they answered. Jesus said to them, you will drink the cup I drink and be baptized with the baptism I am baptized with. But to sit at my right or my left is not for me to grant. These places belong to those for whom they have been prepared. And when the ten heard about this, they became indignant with James and John. Jesus called them together and said, You know that those who are regarded as rulers of the Gentiles, that is the non-Jewish people groups, lord it over them, and their high officials exercise authority over them. Not so with you. Instead, whoever wants to become great among you must become your servant. And whoever wants to be first must be slave of all. For even the Son of Man did not come to be served, but to serve, and to give his life as a ransom for many. Do you see the issue here? James and John are followers of Jesus, but they're still using their old success metric. They're still pursuing power and status. They misunderstood what Jesus being the Messiah is all about. They thought that the Messiah, the saviour promised in the Old Testament, was going to be a mighty warrior, a powerful king who would rule the nation of Israel and overthrow the Roman Empire that was currently oppressing them. They thought the Messiah would restore power to the kingdom of Israel, winning battles over their enemies and ushering in a new golden age. And James and John go, yeah. We know Jesus is the Messiah. We've seen his power at work. He is the promised warrior king, and we want to be in the room where it happens. But Jesus shows that they misunderstood what being the Messiah is all about. He is the promised king, but he's not going to sit on a human throne. He's going to rule all the heavens and the earth. There is a battle to be fought. But it's not a battle against the Roman Empire. It's against sin and death itself. There is something that needs restoring. But it isn't the power of the kingdom of Israel. It's the relationship between humanity and God. And Jesus is going to do all of this. But he's not going to do it in the way that James and John expect. It says in the book of Isaiah, Here is my servant, whom I uphold, my chosen one in whom I delight. I will put my spirit on him and he will bring justice to the nations. He will not shout or cry out or raise his voice in the streets. A bruised reed he will not break and a smoldering wick he will not snuff out. In faithfulness he will bring forth justice. He will not falter or be discouraged till he establishes justice on earth. In his teaching, the islands will put their hope. And it goes on to say, surely he took up our pain and bore our suffering. Yet we considered him punished by God, stricken by him and afflicted. But he was pierced for our transgressions. He was crushed for our iniquities. The punishment that brought us peace was on him, and by his wounds we are healed. We all, like sheep, have gone astray. Each of us has turned to our own way, and the Lord has laid on him the iniquity of us all. So Jesus is the Messiah. He's going to bring justice to the nations. But it's not through human might or rule. Is through his sacrifice for us, dying the death that we deserved on the cross. By his wounds, we are healed. 
This is our story. This is our testimony of what Jesus has done for us, right? And I think if we're honest, sometimes we can fall into the same pattern as James and John, can't we? We follow Jesus, but we find ourselves falling back into the old success metric. We compare ourselves to other people. We find our self-worth in what other people say about us, rather than in our identity as children of God. Maybe we value what we achieve really highly, perhaps too highly. Maybe we throw our weight around and boss people around, like Jesus says the Gentile rulers do in the passage from Mark. Jesus called them together and said, you know that those who are regarded as rulers of the Gentiles lord it over them, and their high officials exercise authority over them. Not so with you. Not so with you. As followers of Jesus, there is a different way of doing things. There is a better way, a countercultural way of living that we are to pursue. Jesus has a new metric for success, and he lays it out in the passage. Whoever wants to become great among you must be your servant, and whoever wants to be first must be slave of all. Being a servant is the key. That's Jesus' metric for success. How servant-hearted are you? Doesn't look like culture's idea of success, does it? What does it look like to have a servant heart? Here's a few ideas. It looks like putting other people's needs above your own. It looks like opening your home to people, even when it's inconvenient. It looks like meeting people's needs for food, for help, for community, perhaps even if they're not willing to voice those needs. It looks like listening to people. It looks like making time for people. It looks like looking out for people who are struggling and helping them through. It looks like loving people, even and especially when they don't deserve it. Most importantly, it looks like having the right attitude in all of that. It looks like having the right attitude towards service. We can do everything I've just said, but if we do it begrudgingly or resentfully, that's not the heart of a follower of Jesus. We are called to be servant-hearted, to a life of humility. The world doesn't revolve around us. We're not the main characters in this story. We are called to bless others in service to God. It's a difficult assignment, right? The good news is that we have an example to follow. Jesus says, For even the Son of Man did not come to be served, but to serve, and to give his life as a ransom for many. If you want an example of servant-hearted living, Jesus of Nazareth is it. He is the example. Be with Jesus. Become like Jesus. Do what Jesus did. That's a recipe for a servant heart. That is a metric for success. And that's exactly what the Apostle Paul recommends in his letter to the Philippians. Do nothing out of selfish ambition or vain conceit. Rather, in humility, value others above yourselves, not looking to your own interests, but each of you to the interests of the others. In your relationships with one another, have the same mindset as Christ Jesus, who, being in very nature God, did not consider equality with God something to be used to his own advantage. Rather, he made himself nothing by taking the very nature of a servant being made in human likeness, and being found in appearance as a man, he humbled himself by becoming obedient to death, even death on a cross. Therefore God exalted him to the highest place and gave him the name that is above every name, 
that at the name of Jesus every knee should bow, in heaven and on earth and under the earth, and every tongue acknowledge that Jesus Christ is Lord, to the glory of God the Father. Amen? This is our example to follow. Have the same mindset as Christ Jesus. This is the metric for success. How like Jesus have I been today? How Christ-like have I been today? And there's a call on us this morning to be servant-hearted, not just as individuals, but as a community. God's been speaking to us over the last few years about being like spiritual midwives, about being like gardeners tending young plants as we bring hope to the Cherwell Valley, as we tell people about Jesus and as we make disciples. And if you ask any midwife or any gardener, they will tell you it is not a glamorous job. But this is the call that God has placed on us as his people. To be a people with bruised and weary feet. To have soil and dirt on our hands and under our fingernails. To have blood on our clothes as we care for people in pain. To be the servants of the communities around us to be the servants of the people of the Cherwell Valley. Imagine what it would be like if we all adopted this attitude of service. What would we see? Who would we meet? And what would people see when they look at us? My prayer is that they would see Jesus, that they would see the hands and feet of Jesus, tending to their pain, ministering to them, walking beside them in the mess of daily life. This sounds like a community that you want to be part of. Can I invite you to stand and I'm going to pray. Lord Jesus, you are the desire of our hearts. You are everything we could hope for. You are beyond our wildest dreams. We commit ourselves afresh to following you this morning. Where we've been using old metrics of success to measure ourselves, where we've been aiming for things that aren't you, we're sorry. We repent and we turn back to you. Would you redirect us? Would you redirect our hearts and bring them in line with yours? Teach us to be servant-hearted as we follow your example. Would service be a joy to us as we serve you and serve those around us. Would you make us a people who bind up the brokenhearted, who mourn with those who mourn? Would you make us gardeners and midwives who serve the communities of the Chawa Valley? Lord Jesus, would our service bring you glory? Would it point people to you to the freedom and transformation that you bring.